Ooh. So, so good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is James Sterling. I'm provost here at Imperial College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to what is the eighth annual Briscoe uh, lecture, and, and a especially warm welcome to those of you visiting the college uh, for the first time. We're delighted to have you here. So the Briscoe lecture is one of the highlights in our lecture uh, calendar, and it's one that I personally always look forward to because the topics are always so interesting and so informative and the speakers are so eminent and tonight's lecture, this evening's lecture, is absolutely no exception. In fact, um, it's probably the first time that I can remember when uh, the lecture has been previewed already in today's Times Higher Education. So uh, if you'd like to, it's a fantastic article, it's entitled Research Must Transcend the Dystopian Mindset of the Past Half Century. It's available online and I thoroughly recommend it. And it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's basically what, what our speaker will be talking about um, this evening. <coughs> so the lecture, why is it called the Briscoe Lecture? It's named after or in honor of um, Vincent Briscoe, who is a distinguished scientist and professor of inorganic chemistry here at Imperial between 1932 and 1955. Briscoe is credited with providing the first scientific advice to the security service, the forerunner, I suppose, to MI5, almost 100 years ago during uh, the First World War. And as the college history book, history of the college enigmatically uh, puts it, we still don't know half of what Vincent Briscoe uh, was up to in those days, but I suppose that's the whole point. Um, but scientific advice, of course, is now rightly seen as essential for governments deploying technology and, and policy on matters of um, <coughs> security. And here at Imperial, uh, much of that research is done through our Institute for Security, Science and Te Technology, ISST, who are the organizers and sponsors of the, the Briscoe um, lectures. It's been an exciting 12 months last year for the ISST and one of the co-directors, Chris Hankin, will, will be telling you a little bit more about that. Uh, uh, at the end of the lecture, for example, we're delighted this year to be recognized once again as a center for ex center of excellence in cybersecurity research by GCSQ, GCHQ, also forged new links with institutions all around the world, Norway, Japan, and Singapore. And earlier this year, the Institute welcomed a new co-director. It's my pleasure to welcome and thank Professor Bill Lee from the Department of Materials, who is now co-director of the ISST, strengthening the already strong uh, leadership uh, team. Now, if you want to learn more about the ISST, Chris will say a bit more at the end, but there's also these brochures that you can pick up uh, at the end. Now, interestingly, one of the activities that the ISST uh, is involved in uh, uh, currently is that uh, we recently forged a new partnership with King's College London, which will deliver doctoral training to social scientists in strategic, regional, and security studies and this is particularly interesting because it relates to the theme of this evening's uh, lecture, the importance of the collaboration and co-working of scientists and social scientists in addressing matters of uh, security and risk and threat. And I was thinking about that because I, I, one of the things I worry about a lot is losing the data on the hard drive on my laptop. And there are two risks, two types of risks to that. The thing, the hardware might just crash when I lose my data. And in a way, I can engineer the risk out, out of that by careful design and manufacturing and maintenance. I can minimize, I hope, that particular risk. But the other type of risk is when I lose the data because someone has hacked in to my laptop and wiped the disk clean. So there you see two risks. The first one you can probably quantify quite easily if you know the, the engineering around the hard drive. The second one, of course, because it involves a human factor, a human agent, is, uh, at least in principle, much harder to, to actually quantify. So those 
two types of risk, I think, exemplify uh, what we talk about when we, we talk about the need for scientists to be working alongside social scientists in assessing risks like that. Now, we could have no better speaker uh, to take us more into that subject than our speaker this evening. It's my very great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Bill Girodi from the University of Bath to deliver the lecture. Uh, Bill is Professor and Chair of International Relations in the Department of Politics, Languages and International Studies at the University of Bath, focusing on risk, resilience, radicalization and the politics of fear. He has been in his current role at, at Bath since October 2014. Previously, he held posts in Canada and Singapore, as well as at the Defence Academy uh, here in the United Kingdom and in the War Studies Group of King's College London, where he coordinated a large interdisciplinary interinstitutional ESRC-funded project under the new Security Challenges uh, Programme. And it would be very remiss of me if I didn't mention the fact that Bill is also a uh, distinguished alumnus of Imperial College, where he read physics. And we were just reminiscing about uh, physics at Imperial um, back, uh, back, back in the day. So, ladies and gentlemen, could, gentlemen, can you please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker for the eighth annual Briscoe Lecture, Professor Bill Girodi. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sterling. And um, I was thinking when you mentioned that we still don't know half of what uh, Professor Briscoe, Vincent Briscoe, was up to, I thought, well, isn't that true of most academics? <laughs> <laughs> or is it simply that we don't understand what half of them are? The, um, I, I, I suppose I should start by extending my thanks to the Institute uh, for inviting me here this evening, and in particular to Professor Chris Hankin, its co-director, together with Professor Bill Lee, for their kind invitation, as well as their staff, who've been extremely helpful, uh, and Dr. Deep Chana, who is also one of their staff, who is actually a former student of mine, as well as a former colleague of mine from King's College London. So anything you find unsatisfying over the next 40 minutes or so is entirely down to them. Um, I'm particularly pleased to be, as far as I can tell, the, the first former student from Imperial College to give the Briscoe Lecture. I studied physics here, as you've just heard, in the early 1980s, before becoming distracted by the impact of society on science. And I have an additional rationale for giving this lecture, um, which is that as I sought to understand a little bit more about the life and times of Vincent Briscoe, I discovered that he'd published in the Bulletin de la Société Chimique de France in 1942, in one of the same years as my grandfather had. So you can see the Briscoe references there at the top. Uh, he's a co-author, so you'd have to go to the uh, other authors to find out what he was writing about. And then you can see a Derodi tucked in there underneath, uh, who happens to be uh, one of my grandfathers. But aside from that personal connection, we remember and celebrate Briscoe today because his achievements, particularly in relation to wartime security, still have relevance for us collectively as science and technology continue to be called upon to help address our security challenges. And Imperial College is certainly at the vanguard of these, not the security challenges, the addressing the security challenges. I want to suggest that such activities, though, whilst necessary, are not sufficient to imbue our collective and personal lives with deeper meaning. If it is the threat that drives activities today, as a senior official announced at the start of a funding event for security science and technology recently, then we really are all someone somewhat diminished by that. Because in effect, that would mean that threats lead and we are simply called upon to follow. In fact, we ought never to lose sight of the fact uh, that we have a broader purpose for science and, and society beyond the threats and challenges that we confront today. And meaning is really the theme of my lecture this evening, or at least the contribution that a proper contextualized understanding of the social sciences can provide to this. At the height of the Cold War, and in view of the then spiraling cost of pursuing subatomic research, 
The founding director of Fermilab in the United States, Robert Rathburn Wilson, was called on to testify before a congressional committee to account for the work of what was, at the time, the world's most significant particle accelerator. Some of the congressmen wanted to know what the contribution of high energy physics was to securing the nation's defense. Wilson advised, it has nothing to do directly with defending our country except to make it worth defending. It may be that a country that is worth defending in that non-financial sense of worth, as Wilson intended, can cultivate more friends, both externally and internally, but one that may lose sight of the need for broader purpose and direction. A case of knowing the price of everything and the value of nothing, maybe. And fortunately for us all, I think, on that day at the end of the 1960s, it was Wilson who won the argument. I recall when Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, passed away just over six years ago now, how one of the obituaries I read at the time offered a more contextualized, and in my mind at least, more balanced appraisal than many of the others written by various IT boosters and doomsters. President Obama described Jobs as the man who had put the internet in our pockets. Others mentioned him in the same breath as possibly the greatest and most prolific of all American innovators, Thomas Edison. The assessment I preferred, however, proposed that perhaps his problem was to be born at a time when socially and technologically, mankind has pretty low ambitions. Jobs was a genius, it's probably fair to say, but he was the genius who captured the zeitgeist of our introspective age. His technologies allow people to update their status to their countless and largely unknown virtual friends, as well as to reveal their most immediate and inane thoughts to the entire world, in the space which one of my journalist friends describes as where the idle rich meet the idle poor. Jobs delivered a lot more, of course, though notably he never allowed his own children access to an iPad. Science and technology, like individuals, are also products of their times, or at least circumscribed by these. For instance, social historians have noted how the medieval form of open field strip farming not only kept society in check, but technology too. Enclosure and private ownership, a process not really completed until the middle of the 19th century, while creating an army of landless vagabonds, also encouraged the pursuit of greater efficiencies in agriculture that in turn led to its mechanization. So for instance, the construction of a ribbon loom in what is now Germany in the late 16th century was simply too far ahead of its times. The machine was destroyed and its inventor murdered by the authorities over two centuries before the Luddites, because its existence threatened the dominant modes of production and control. In other words, social forms can enable or constrain technology, and even our ability to sense that something may be possible, as well as, it, as what it is that we actually look for and how we interpret the data. Science and technology also have to make use of the words and cultural reference points available to them in their efforts to reveal more profound revelations that can only then be tested in practice and over time. When I studied here at Imperial College in the information technology stone age, there were still computer punch cards. I also took a course on the philosophy of science, which I guess gradually reoriented my interests to other more social and cultural forces and influences behind the ideas and developments we mostly take as having been inevitable. Like many others, I read Thomas Kuhn's work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, a staple of this more socially embedded understanding of science ever since its publication in 1962. Through it, you begin to appreciate how reticent we all are to social change. Scientific paradigms are usually just chipped away at at the margins. It's rare to witness a revolutionary transformation. And on this 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, it may be worth citing that most infamous revolutionary of all, Leon Trotsky, who pointed out that 
the swift changes of mass views and moods in an epoch of revolution derive not from the flexibility and mobility of man's mind, but just the opposite, from its deep conservatism. It's because the system, the authorities, and even the people resist change, that when it comes, it can be so dramatic. Marx, too, had somewhat more poetically proposed in 1852 that the tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare in the minds of the living by which he meant that we inevitably look to the past for reference points to attribute authority, meaning, and purpose to ourselves, but we do so at our peril, at the risk of failing to take ourselves seriously and appreciating what is truly new in the present. And sometimes we look for and find patterns where there are none, which points to another of my themes here this evening, the need for strategic framing or clarity in our objectives to avoid getting blinded by operational preoccupations. We could suggest, for instance, that those looking to Putin's Russia as evidence that the sleeping Soviet monster never really went away are failing to take new times, new trends, and new conditions, many elements of which lie much closer to home, into consideration. Russia allegedly funding UKIP or placing $100,000 worth of ads on Facebook seem unlikely explanations for the 17.4 million people who voted for Brexit or the 62 million plus who voted for Trump, especially in the light of Hillary Clinton's $1.2 billion campaign, which outspent Trump's by a factor of two to one. Hillary also had Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google on her team, who employed those supposed pillars of contemporary politics, big data and micro-targeting. It seems easier, maybe, to blame a technical trick by the Russians and look to prevent it than to accept a genuine political problem. And similarly, those seeking to understand al-Qaeda and ISIS primarily through the prism of religion or as some foreign ideology may be making similar errors in failing to appreciate why it is that their supposed views appear to resonate so much with a considerable number of primarily young people here in the West. Sir Isaac Newton, in his famous letter to Robert Hooke of 1676, understood the contextual dimension when stating that, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. In doing so, he co-opted the Greek myth of the blinded hunter Orion carrying the youth Sedalian to guide him. And while some historians propose this to have been meant as an insult to Hook, we can reasonably adduce that in those days, the giants Newton pointed to, whether consciously or not, were not simply scientific ones, but social ones. The moderns of his age, including Descartes and Hook, had been guided by the ancients of the distant past. And those who had, not so long ago, helped to depose a pope and beheaded a king loomed large in Newton's historical and more immediate memory. It was social transformations that had laid down the conditions for the rapid advances in science that Newton would then become a conduit for. The motto of the Royal Society, Nullius in Verba, on the word of no one, itself adopted from the Roman poet Horace, the son of a freed slave, was the product of an age that came to take objective inquiry to be just as important as the pronouncements of monarchs or the word of God. Newton, of course, as most people then were, was a believer too. So it's not surprising that he might appropriate the religious concept of a universal presence or force that could act immediately across space for his gravitational theory. Faraday, in 1845, doubting such instantaneous action at a distance, was led to adopting the military metaphor of a field to indicate how each point within it was to be subject to a unique force that acted in a specific direction. And in a similar way, though in a very different arena, we can note how Darwin, too, in developing his understanding of evolution, was drawn, in his day, 
to the market metaphor of competition. I give these examples not as idle historical curiosities, but rather because it is of paramount importance for us today to understand that if we are to appreciate the cultural contours of what we do in relation to security science and technology, then we must, first and foremost, have an accurate appreciation of the times in which we live, as well as the, the dominant metaphors, mores, meanings and models we have to draw upon. It may come as a surprise, for instance, to note how one of our dominant contemporary cultural perceptions that we live in a particularly fragile environment, dominated by rapid change, clouded by a considerable degree of uncertainty regarding our ability to understand it, the things we don't know, we don't know, as Donald Rumsfeld once put it, is relatively recent in origin. For instance, the insight that climate change can be induced through human action and that atmospheric CO2 levels impact global temperatures is over a century old, but it was not perceived of in the same way then as it is today. Its first exponent, the Nobel Prize winning Swedish scientist Svante Arrhenius, even expected that this effect might be of benefit to humanity. As late as the second half of the 1970s, John Mason, or Sir Basil John Mason, himself a former professor of cloud physics here at Imperial, who was by then the director general of the meteorological office, a post he held until 1983, asserted in a lecture to the Royal Society of Arts that there's no question that climate is variable and that variations have a greater social and economic impact than ever before. But nevertheless, he'd also concluded, the atmosphere is a robust system with a built-in capability to counteract any perturbation. Notably, the sense that the climate system might be unstable emerged in a period of considerable political instability, the 1960s. And this then accelerated in the context of the global economic slowdown and associated energy crisis of the 1970s. Undoubtedly, the Cold War race for an impact of ballistic <laughs> missiles and nuclear weapons accentuated such perceptions. But to give them their dues, there were benefits too. Rocket technology put Neil Armstrong on the moon and also gave some of the first and most enduring images of the Earth viewed from space taken by the various Apollo teams. Now, whether you read those images as images of beauty and wonder or of fragility and isolation may say more about you and the times you live in than the images themselves. Likewise, the bomb brought with it advancements in the earth sciences and atmospheric physics, as, like it or not, physicists were now able, for the first time, to track the movement of radioactive particles through the atmosphere. But it also brought visions so influential that in the late 80s, one science writer discussing the possibility that dinosaurs had been wiped out by a giant asteroid strike noted how, like everyone else in this last part of the 20th century, I carry within my consciousness the images of mushroom clouds and devastating explosions. I remember as a child watching television shows about how to build fallout shelters, and I recall how the sound of a plane at night always made me wonder if this was the one carrying the bomb. We've all come of age with the certainty that when the world ends, death will come from the skies. The idea that the dinosaurs perished in the Holocaust that followed the biggest impact of them all feels right because it fits so neatly into the nightmares that project our own demise. So theory, then, can be adopted, in the first instance at least, by its resonance via imagery with the contemporary imagination. In a similar way, Philip Alsabez, the director of the public health program at Adelphi University in New York, notes how the flu outbreak of 1918 hardly registered in the Western imagination until the 1970s, when the notion, now widely believed, that flu epidemics occur in every decade also emerged. The notion that climate change may be abrupt is even more recent, dating from the early 2000s. But when paradigms shift so rapidly, 
from stability at one point to fragility at the next, then we should recognize that this may be driven more by changes in society than by changes in nature. Last year, I completed part of a project for the Goethe Henkel Stiftung, or foundation, in Germany. It was looking at the impact of, on people of being on the receiving end of constant warnings. It's well evidenced how, with the passing of the old Cold War world order, a focus on insecurity and instability emerged that reflected the breakdown of the old certainties. With this, there came a proliferation of advice and warnings about all manner of risks from a profusion of agencies, both official and unofficial. The media, of course, have a field day poking fun at some of the more dubious ones of these, bans on children running in the playground or doormats pronounced to be fire or tripping hazards by local authorities. But some threat advice, as we know, is deadly serious too. Advice on what to do in a terrorist or shooting incident or on technical standards for cladding buildings. How do we ensure those are heard among the cacophony of more dubious or less significant advice? What became evident through my research was the extent of public disengagement from much of this. Popular responses to the profusion of contemporary warnings include disinterest, fatigue, and even defiance. The key here is not the specific advice or evidence regarding any particular type of incident, which can usually appear entirely reasonable, but rather the sheer cumulative impact of being warned about almost anything all of the time. From public health to counter-terrorism, climate change to child safety, from what we eat to how much we drink, hardly a day goes by without some discussion or advice relating to these. Safety and precaution have become an integral part of our cultural landscape. And while individuals may choose to assess risks in order to keep themselves and their loved ones safe and well, something fundamental changes when those assessments are imposed upon them. For a start, warnings transfer responsibility. And so they can also be read as a form of blame avoidance or denial of accountability. What's more, the evidence, its interpretation, as well as the intention behind these, are open to contestation. Simply labeling those who fail to comply as maladaptive or trying to modify their behavior surreptitiously is not, in my opinion, the long-term answer. Such technical responses reflect an unwillingness or inability by the authorities to consider the actions of others or seek to influence these through a moral or political framework. Because the truth is, in our supposedly post-truth world, that people do not act on the basis of evidence alone. Rather, we need to take their values and beliefs into consideration and seek to engage with those. Protectionist paternalism reflects a rather low view of people that may ultimately be self-defeating. It also points to the cultural disconnect between the actions of the few, however well-intentioned, and the values of the many charged with living by them. Responding to the Foreign Office advice regarding traveling to Bali in the aftermath of the bombs there in 2002, Sir Lawrence Friedman, now Emeritus Professor at King's College London, writing in the journal Intelligence and National Security, noted how little could be achieved through general exhortation. Rather, authorities ought to share in a sense of strategic framing with the public. We used to call that politics. Strategy is a much misunderstood and misused term. It's often assumed to be what the people at the top do, as opposed to the operational matters the rest of us are meant to preoccupy ourselves with. But it's only by imparting a common understanding of the situation and encouraging identification with shared objectives that tactical plans and operational activity can flow. Information matters to all of us, but it, it's how this is interpreted according to our strategic framing that indicates what to consider first and how to act. 
Strategy must certainly consider the actions and reactions of external agents and forces, but it should not be driven by these. It's about setting the agenda on our terms, not simply responding to elements beyond our control. Otherwise, we end up compromising our aims, confusing cause and effect, and become driven by self-fulfilling prophecies. Preparing for emergencies and handling risks are undoubtedly strategic priorities, but they rely on more than just technical capabilities. Our values as a society remind us of where we are going, not just to narrow our gaze on the challenges we face now. Strategic framing enables us all to develop a sense of collective purpose beyond the threats. Unfortunately today, safety and security often come across as the end in themselves. We've shifted from articulating threats to eliciting or demanding actions and behaviors that are deemed desirable. And when choices are made for people rather than by them, it also allows them to evade accountability because it was not their decision. It prevents them from becoming more knowledgeable and truly on side. And it is demoralizing in the proper sense of the word as it denies people the opportunity to become moral agents. Instead, official pronouncements increasingly come across as messages from remote and alien authorities. Warnings become just background noise. And contrary to the perceptions and prejudices of some, those who ignore and defy these are not the least educated or the most disconnected, but often the reverse. So when the Director General of the World Health Organization, Margaret Chan, declared in relation to 2009 H1N1 pandemic influenza that it really is all of humanity that is under threat, it was many healthcare professionals that governments relied upon who refused to be inoculated for it because they experienced and understood events rather differently. Indeed, when writing her independent review of the UK response to the H1N1 outbreak, Dame Deirdre Hine noted how the Civil Contingencies Committee had been advised early on that modeling capability would be low due to the lack of available data. Nevertheless, it was, quote, clear that modeling the pandemic was seen as a priority, leading her to remark that modeling provides easily understandable figures and because of its mathematical and academic nature may seem scientifically very robust. In other words, forecasts were produced to provide ministers and officials with things to do and say as they needed to be seen to be taking action. Cultural framing became just as important as virology. It was a case, among many others I could point to, of perceived operational need driving tactical intelligence in the absence of strategic framing, beyond saying that we were all at risk, even when the available evidence indicated otherwise. The rise of risk management has encouraged a rigid fixation on worst case scenarios, rather than a balanced extrapolation from the most likely ones. And risk management ought never to be simply about trying to reduce or eliminate risks and mitigate their consequences. Rather, risk management is about tackling specific risks agreed on within a wider social framework that also invariably requires us to take risks. The biggest mistakes, therefore, come from not taking risks, from not engaging people, and above all, from not being clear as to our own strategic purpose in the first place. Effective risk management requires us to know what we are for, not simply what we are against. Threats may drive some of our activities, but we ought also to have a mission of our own in advance. The cultural prioritization of risk mitigation was evident at the time of the Deepwater Horizon oil exploration platform explosion in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. BP, who leased the platform, had a risk management manual lodged with the US authorities, which was rightly derided 
for its commitment to the protection of walruses, seals, and sea lions, of which there aren't any there. But what the critics miss is that we live in an age of performative documents, from mission statements to codes of conduct, corporate social responsibility manuals to risk management plans that all appear to be written with interchangeable terms and image and reputation mostly in mind. So BP's document, as well as that of the other big companies drilling there, was written by a subcontractor. It included 40 pages on how to manage the media in an emergency, but just nine on dealing with an oil spill. Because when risk becomes viewed as simply something to be avoided, rather than as an opportunity, then the management of risk increasingly becomes a ritual, as Professor Michael Power of the London School of Economics has put it. That the concept of black swans has become one of the most common metaphors of recent times speaks volumes as to the challenges we face. Black swans, or in essence, the need to expect the unexpected, makes sense, but only up to a point. Because while sudden and unexpected shocks can and do undermine institutions and individuals, slow and steady drift that occurs right in front of us can be just as destabilizing. In many instances, what is experienced as shock is really drift that has gone ignored or unnoticed for a considerable period of time. A couple of years ago, I was traveling to London to give a talk on cybersecurity and privacy at BT Tower while reflecting on how my journey, delayed by a failing 40-year-old diesel locomotive, had also been made unpleasant by the absence of any air conditioning itself a 100-year-old technology. It's striking how the discussion about the so-called Internet of Things, whereby all of our devices may one day become interconnected, has apparently been overrun by those more interested in the Internet part of the phrase, rather than focusing much on the Things element. But as a report for IDG Connect published last year suggests, as the Internet becomes ever more sophisticated, it is increasingly connecting aging things. Maybe rather than further securing this aging infrastructure, it might be a more positive approach to argue for it to be replaced entirely and to design security in from the outset. That takes time, and there are conflicting priorities, of course, but the goal is expansive rather than defensive. After all, the only institutions and businesses that were genuinely affected by the WannaCry ransomware attack earlier this year were those still running largely outmoded software. That's not to deny either the intent or the growing scale of such incidents, although we should note, too, that continuous media coverage and statements from various authorities using metaphors from the worlds of disease and radiation, such as infection and meltdown, may do more to encourage hackers. And maybe those who ignored or simply missed the latest IT warnings from government were too busy handling the latest workplace reorganization and dealing with staff shortages. Many advocates of the Internet of Things appear to have quite low horizons for it anyway, such as sensors that allow consumers and businesses to get more from their existing assets for less, including by optimizing operations or through just-in-time maintenance. Not so much about doing more with new things than less with existing ones, like a 21st century version of make, do, and mend. Hardly what might inspire our detractors or the disillusioned into joining us on an ambitious venture into the unknown. So maybe it's time for more IT professionals to focus on the tangible world of things that we actually live with. For years, innovation has become reduced to innovation in IT, often with a view to reducing capital investment, which itself is running at an all-time low. The primary reason for anyone facing a power outage, for instance, is not terrorism, but to do with infrastructure. That's not to say that planners ought not to concern themselves with the potential for deliberate attacks, either physical or cyber, but in the meantime, problems when they occur are mainstream rather than extreme. They usually have to do with aging power lines, substations that are prone to flooding 
and a lack of primary power generation. And the challenges to, tho and the challenges to those are more often cultural than technical, such as opposition to the installation of new cables and pylons and delays over the introduction of new nuclear power plants. Similarly, while not wanting to put you off your dinner tonight, beyond the exotic concerns regarding terrorists wanting to poison our food or water supplies, all of the research completed to date in relation to food defense incidents from the 1940s to the present day suggests that the biggest threat, aside from industrial accidents, comes from your loved ones, or not so loved ones, making use of those tried and tested tools of the trade, primarily rat poison and cyanide. Angry or disillusioned insiders, we know, are currently one of the main threats to our aging things. But if we examine Tim Berners-Lee's original vision, which led to the World Wide Web, produced for his then boss at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, in 1989, it was not so much about connecting things as people. His challenge was the high turnover of people at CERN, just as much as the sheer volume of constantly changing information they created and the concomitant loss of institutional memory when they left. In our age of so-called smart regions, smart cities, smart grids, and smart networks, it would seem that the only thing left out from being described as smart are the people, a process that's been described by some as algorithmic fatalism, and that reflects our diminished view of ourselves as purposeful and transformative agents. As I've noted elsewhere, people who believe in a cause or project are far more effective agents of it than those who are coerced or corralled. But to benefit from this power of conviction, there needs to be a concomitant intellectual or ideological engagement that is often absent today. Whatever else we might believe about so-called intelligent systems and big data, it is only people who can adapt with a vision and purpose to new times, rather than simply adjust as machines and processes do. Just last month, the journal Nature announced the advent of a new IT program that had mastered the game of Go to the point of defeating a world champion, as well as developing entirely new strategies of its own within just a few days, despite no guidance beyond the rules. It led to the usual concerns being expressed about algorithms developing faster than society and calls for ethical guidance. What was left out was any insight into how the program had celebrated its achievement. As a physicist turned political scientist, I should make it clear that I'm not at all downbeat about the benefits and potential of IT and big data. But maybe big data's real problem, for now at least, is that it's simply not big enough, often enough. When Arthur C. Clarke wrote his Profiles of the Future, in the same year as Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he noted two failures that consistently occur when we look into the future. Failure of nerve and failure of imagination. There's a world of difference, for instance, between using big data to detect gravitational waves, thereby exposing what Newton could not, or using it to run the Large Hadron Collider, our modern-day equivalent of Fermilab, to find out what things are really made of, as opposed to trying to save a bit of money by turning the thermostat down remotely, knowing when to replace or relocate stock or inventory, and even trying to predict who might be becoming radicalized from changes in their use of words on social media. Even the simplest of human actions involves levels of complexity, nuance, and interpretation that continue to defy the logic of coding and self-taught computer programs. Neuroscience may tell us which part of the brain lights up when we see the color blue, but it says nothing about how we associate that with the smells and sounds of having been by the sea many years ago and what that meant to us. Or that blue stands for freedom in the French tricolore and what that word freedom really means, how it comes about and why most value it more than efficiency. Because unlike programs, we continuously seek to transcend or transgress the limits we find. People have emergent properties that transform the rules of the game 
as well as the game itself. Information technology may sometimes tell us what, but it rarely tells us why. It's brilliant at revealing what is, but hopeless at imagining what ought to be. And those latter elements are the very stuff of what makes us human, what might even radicalize someone nowadays, though just as interestingly, mostly not. If you want to understand a human being, it might be more useful to read some great literature than to examine what they post on Facebook. Better still, talk to them, because even though they'll keep things from you, that will still tell you more about them than you can assume from their purchasing patterns. No movement for social progress from the French Revolution to the civil rights movement ever came from simply accepting the available evidence as given. Rather, they fought for a vision of society that only existed in an imagined future. But by obsessing about reducing risk, we inevitably obscure our opportunities too. By fixating on the problems that confront us in the present, we fail to shape what could be in the future and to inspire others. We simply manage rather than lead. Maybe by becoming more ambitious for big data, as well as the things it connects, and above all for ourselves, we might discover new things that allow us to handle old problems, as people did before the contemporary self-limiting and somewhat dystopian post-Cold War mindset set in. As I've noted previously, our outlook can have a determining effect on how we view the available evidence, as well as what we consider to be evidence in the first place, including how we go about looking for and measuring it. Some may be clear that we live in an age of renewed and unparalleled security challenges, from dealing with ISIS, through a belligerent North Korea, and on to an increasingly assertive Russia and China. I note that even just a few years ago, Sir Richard Dearlove, the former chief of MI6, thought differently, noting in a speech delivered at the Royal United Services Institute that there seemed to him, at least, to have been a loss of perspective and proportion in our dealing with threats when compared to when we were facing the full might of the Soviet Union and its satellite states across the globe. Be that as it may, those who promote the bleaker view should be alert to the fact that the science and technologies they develop in accordance will, are likely to be more blinkered and self-limiting. One aspect of that may be a fixation on primarily external challenges. If we really want to build resilience into society, then maybe that comes not just from gathering more intelligence, conducting more surveillance, or spending more on detection, protection, barriers, vaccines, and equipment. Rather, it comes first from having greater clarity as to who we are, what we stand for, and where we are going. Only with such a strategic outlook in mind can we then ask more tactical questions regarding the challenges we currently face and go on to address operational matters, such as how to deal with or interdict these. Whether people really become radicalized in a disturbingly short period of time, for instance, or more likely, they begin to engage with a dystopian discourse that speaks to their long-term experience and sense of existing frustrations, distorted through dominant and largely negative cultural presumptions, is an important distinction. It points to how the interception of communications comes far too late in the process, as well as how some authorities have, in effect, given up on trying to understand why people believe the things that they do and trying to shape these, and now aim simply to stop them from acting instead. Writing in the Washington Post in 2015, Avinash Tharoor, a former student at the University of Westminster, where Mohammed Mwazi, who became known as Jihadi John, had also studied, told of an incident in a lecture on international relations there when a young woman had announced in class that, as a Muslim, I don't believe in democracy. One element that surprised Tharoor was an unwillingness to engage with the student. Maybe the instructor could have pointed to some gains for women from democracy or to different types of democracy that the class might wish to evaluate the pros and cons of, such as direct democracy, representative democracy, deliberative democracy, and so on. Instead, for fear of causing offense, maybe, itself a relatively recent, if well-meaning, concern, or worse, not knowing how to argue for democracy at all, the comment went unchallenged. An uncritical and unquestioning culture, then, 
or one where people are increasingly reluctant to express their views or challenge the beliefs of others may be one of the social drivers we ought to address politically rather than presuming all solutions to lie within the sphere of prevention. In 1959, the chemist and novelist Charles Percy Snow, or C.P. Snow, gave what came to be known as the Two Cultures Lecture in Cambridge, which contrasted the insight and attitude of those working in the sciences and humanities to each other. I'm not sure today, almost 60 years on, whether those working in the humanities understand any more about the second law of thermodynamics than they did back then. I suspect, sadly, in our highly instrumentalist age, that those in the sciences may have even less time to read not just literature, but politics and sociology, as well as history and moral philosophy. I hope I'm wrong. Either way, it remains the case that each side could still do with finding out a little more about the other and hopefully start to work together. There's a good degree of suspicion to be overcome as well as a dystopian mindset to be transcended for both to truly flourish. But above all, we need to start taking people more seriously, not just in a Victorian patrician way of seeking to protect and look after them, but as serious partners and active moral agents of their own and our destinies. Whatever your views on Brexit or the election of Trump are, for instance, or even an even greater challenge than the two cultures is to begin to take seriously and engage with the 50% of our societies that experience life and think differently to ourselves. As John Stuart Mill indicated in the conclusion to On Liberty, the worth of a state in the long run is the worth of the individuals comprising it. And a state which postpones the interests of their mental expansion and elevation to a little more of administrative skill or that semblance of it which practice gives in the details of business. A state which dwarfs its men in order that they may be more docile instruments in its hands, even for beneficial purposes, will find that with small men, no great thing can really be accomplished. And that the perfection of machinery to which it has sacrificed everything will in the end avail it nothing for want of the vital power, which in order that the machine might work more smoothly, it has preferred to banish. Thank you. front row here, so Denise, if you could run down the stairs, uh, obeying the safety rules so that you don't trip. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, my name is Hugo Rosemont. I'm a guest this evening. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, a policy-related question, if I may. The, the UK government's national security strategy is underpinned by what it calls a national security risk assessment. And I wondered whether, uh, flowing from your talk, you believe that that stresses the opportunities, how it balances the opportunities and the risks. Has it fallen into the trap uh, that you seem to be warning against? Thank you. I didn't quite catch the last part. Has it fallen into the trap of perhaps focusing on what we're trying to prevent rather than achieve? Well, two things. Uh, actually, the, the national security strategy is quite an enlightened document in many ways because um, the, it also focuses on projection and how Britain projects itself to the outside world. And I think that's, in my mind, the most important element that's often elided in uh, certainly the counter-terrorism strategy, which focuses much more on uh, more operational matters uh, as well as prevent. Um, the risk assessment, I, I understand. I'm not, I'm not uh, mad, and, and I, I understand the need for, for risk analysis and risk assessment. Um, but I also, I mean, I wrote a piece in Safety Science earlier this year which pointed out that the complexity of some of the models that people develop to produce risk assessment 
it themselves beg a lot of questions, not least about how various variables are weighted in order to achieve the, the kind of policy projections that they do, but also the, you know, the, the capability of those who are then charged with implementing those decisions of wading through and understanding those models. I also, th very final point on this, I, I think when government wants to do something that wasn't in the national risk assessment, it always does. I mean, Libya wasn't in the national risk assessment. Uh, it wasn't consulted when the, I think the Cameron government uh, <coughs> went ahead and, and went there. Um, so it also becomes one of these performative documents. And by the way, the performative document piece is a, is a sociological term, not one that I just made up. There's a question at the front here. I'm afraid we only have one roving mic, it would seem, so. Uh, right, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you, Bill. Tristram Riley-Smith from Cambridge University's Centre for Science and Policy. Uh, I hope I interpreted your fantastic talk rightly and seeing it in many ways as an argument for more responsible research and development in terms of reaching out and connecting with the citizen culture more broadly, perhaps when thinking about the consequences of risky or dangerous science and technology. Um, if I've got that right, I, I th I'd be really interested in your thoughts about how one actually practically achieves that, because it's, it's quite a big ask, I think, even though it's very important. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be here, would I? <laughs> the... I think um, there is a certain irony, I think, that universities nowadays measure a lot of their uh, output in terms of their reaching out to the public, um, and yet they seemed so completely surprised by the, the outcome of the Brexit referendum, which rather suggests that they're either not reaching out or not listening very carefully. Or, um, and we know, for instance, that 90%, uh, according to the Times Higher Education Supplement, of academics and people in universities were certainly in the Remain camp. Now, I, I don't care which side of the divide you're on, but it does concern me when universities become, in effect, monoversities, promoting you know, a single narrative that has become the dominant, polite, accepted way of looking at the world. Uh, and I think we need to create more opportunities to in encourage dissent uh, and engage with it. I, I think it's rather unfortunate uh, when large numbers of people vote for the first time. And, you know, the Brexit referendum was notable for having the largest turnout in British electoral history. Um, a turnout unseen for, you know, over a generation. And then it's, in effect, in my opinion, been kicked into the long grass. And I, I don't think that people will be encouraged by what followed afterwards. Um, and I, I, I do think... The, the more we can um, identify people that are saying things so um, out of kilter and listen to them and try and work out where they're coming from, the better. And I, I, I do think the obsession with banning things for fear of causing hurt or offence today is actually quite damaging to us. Any other questions? Kevin. Uh, yes, there's... there's oh, sorry, Kevin. Just speak. Um, you touched very briefly on the role of the media in terms of perhaps social media, but would you like to say something about how you see uh, the media in this process as to whether it facilitates the relationships that you're arguing for or whether you see it as essentially a, if you put it that way, a dystopian factor in that process? Oddly enough, um, I'm a great advocate for absolute freedom of expression, and so I think the media should be allowed to be as ridiculous and offensive as possible because it forces us to become more judgmental, uh, discerning, uh, and making decisions for ourselves. Uh, I think the media have been propelled into a very unfortunate position in contemporary society because of the decline of political debate between opposed political parties with different views as to what the good life is, it's been propelled into the position of trying to stimulate debate where there isn't any in the political sphere. 
And I think that that's an unfortunate trap that some of them ha have fallen into. I think the downside of fake news is it's more than compensated for, by the way, by the fact that it requires us all to, to, to judge things for ourselves. Um, and, and the great thing about the internet, particularly propagating fake news, is that, uh, you know, it, uh, which might hurt those in authority, and I understand why it does, um, because it's a lament over their lost monopoly over the truth, is that it really removes the monopoly as to what is out there. Uh, so um, media, uh, it's very easy to fall into the trap of castigating them as the, as, as the worst uh, you know, factor in the contemporary world. Whenever I hear anyone being very, very critical about the media, I always suspect that they're really being very critical about the people who read and follow the media. Um, that's who they're surreptitiously trying to criticize. They're basically saying, look, the, our people are simply too thick to see through all of this. That's why we need experts to filter through it and tell them what is good truth uh, from what is not. Uh, and as the Romans asked, you know, who guards the guardians? Uh, it's also ironic, and I'll finish on this point before taking the next question, that for 30 years, certainly in the academy, social scientists in particular have been the ones most prone to saying there's no such thing as truth, everything's relative, um, and now suddenly everybody's keen to rediscover it. So. Thank, thank you for your uh, talk, which is really informative. As a, okay, uh, just thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, as a computer science teacher in a secondary school teaching Key Stage Four and Key Stage Five, um, big data has come down into the syllabus quite recently. What would be your thoughts on engaging 16, 17, 18 year olds with that topic and making it relatable to their lives? I wouldn't, then. that's why you're here. Um, the, I mean, I hope you got the message that, I, you know, big data's here, it's here to stay. Uh, I think, you know, more power to it, the better in many ways. I think the one factor I might introduce into uh, you know, th that age syllabus is about um, the need to develop a greater sense of privacy and trust. You know, because ultimately, a lot of big data issues are around our trust in the authorities. But also, I think we lose something in the contemporary world when we propagate everything about ourselves on our Facebook and our you know, Twitter feed. Um, and the private sphere is absolutely fundamental for people to develop as robust individuals. It's important, I, the, the one thing I say before all of my courses to my class is I don't care what they say in class and how hurtful and offensive it might be perceived of by others. Uh, you know, but the one thing I really disapprove of is people tweeting or putting on social media something that happened in class. Because class is about experimenting, experimenting with ideas, and we can't do that if we can't take risks, if we can't say counterfactuals, if we can't push it to the extreme. Um, I think that stultifies people's ability to, d to develop. So I think you know, there, we need a greater emphasis on privacy in the contemporary world in order to become more responsible public adults. And unfortunately, intrusions into privacy have a chilling effect and will lead, I suspect, drip by drip to a generation maybe of less adult adults. Um, but the, the intrusions into privacy don't come from the, the areas that people imagine the most. It's not the mobile phone companies and IT companies who are you know, getting all your data. I mean, that's an element of it. Uh, it's not even government. It's like we've become a society that doesn't culturally celebrate the need for privacy as a developmental space for individuals. And you can see that even in social factors where, you know, there's that perception that if you don't talk about things, then you're hiding something. Um, and increasingly, public sector workers and social workers are wanting to find out everything about what goes on in the family. And if it's not, you know, if you don't reveal what's going on in the family, then there must be something to hide. It's that erosion occurs right across the board. 
Um, and I think we can only challenge it not through one sector, but by all sectors understanding the significance uh, of that. Okay. <coughs> so uh, I'd like to say a few words and then offer a vote of thanks to, uh, to Bill. Um, he's covered a, a very broad swathe of topics which are of vital importance, I think, to safety, security, and, and risk communication. Um, and uh, I think uh, his um, emphasis on there being more than the data, more than the evidence, as it were, but the need to take values and beliefs into account in making uh, judgments about uh, individuals' behavior uh, underlies the importance of really taking an interdisciplinary approach to these, these questions. Uh, it's essential that we have an understanding of the social sciences uh, if we're really to address the challenges that we face uh, in society and that we, um, as security science, scientists and technologists, are trying to, uh, trying to address. Now, James uh, gave an excellent uh, overview of um, the work of the Institute for Security Science and Technology here at Imperial during his introductory remarks. But he also um, set, set, set uh, a challenge to me to actually add something to that. Um, now, I'm conscious that uh, we have some drinks waiting for you the other side of uh, the corridor outside this room, so I don't really want to get in the way of, of that too much, but there were just a couple of things that I thought I should mention um, that, that have been uh, exciting for us over the last 12 months. Uh, first of all, I think he may have mentioned this, actually. We were once again recognized for another five years as an academic center of excellence for work in cybersecurity research, which certainly touches on some of the issues which uh, Bill raised towards the end of his lecture. And of course, the last 12 months in cybersecurity has been very active. We've seen, um, we've seen the WannaCry um, ransomware attack that Bill mentioned during his lecture, which uh, in the UK mainly affected uh, the NHS. Uh, worldwide, it affected many other areas of uh, society. Uh, we've seen major attacks on banks, and we're beginning to see more and more threats uh, because of this thing called the Internet of Things that Bill mentioned on critical infrastructure and some of the physical systems which are increasingly controlled by, by cyber. Um, we've um, also... Um, sorry, I've lost my, uh, my notes slightly of things that I wanted to say. We, we, we've also recognized these trends in the Institute, uh, and we've started to address some of them by building new activities. So over the last 12 months, we've started new activities looking at security of financial systems, and we've appointed a new associate director, Pantelis Beaton, who's sitting here in one of the front rows, uh, to help us with that. Uh, we've also started working much more closely with the medical faculty here at Imperial to look at some of the challenges which are faced by the healthcare industry, not just the National Health Service, but issues around security of medical devices and the equipment which is deployed in our hospitals. Uh, we have an international outlook, as Imperial does generally, uh, and we've been very successful over the last year in building new international collaborations with Norway, Japan, Cyprus, and uh, in the US. The international uh, dimension is, is important to us, but Bill has given us good and strong reasons why we shouldn't neglect the social sciences and the arts and humanities. This is recognized generally in the UK because the Cross Research Council funding activity for work in this area, which is through the Partnership for Conflict, Crime and Security, brings not only the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council to the table to fund research in this area, but also the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the um, Economic and Social Sciences Research Council. So I think the, uh, the kind of manifesto that Bill was uh, articulating very, very well during his lecture is being recognized certainly at the level of the funding agencies here in the UK. So uh, I mentioned that um, uh, we would like you to join us for a glass of uh, uh, drink and, uh, uh, and some refreshments uh, after the lecture, and that will be immediately opposite behind this lecture room. But before I invite you to join us to do that, I'd like you to uh, join with me once again to thank Bill for the excellent lecture and uh, for coming to Imperial this evening. Thank you. Thank you.